Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks so I can analyze the mental health and personality characteristics at work in the Darley Rotier case. Another question here is, what do I think in terms of her guilt or innocence? So the people in this case, of course, are real people. So just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So first I'll take a look at the timeline, then the evidence and the investigation. I'll look at the trial as well, the mental health and personality characteristics, and answer that question about guilt and innocence. So we start the timeline with Thursday, June 6th, 1996 in Roulette, Texas. This is a town that's 25 miles north of Dallas, Texas. We see it's 2.31 a.m. 26-year-old Darley Rotier calls 911 and reports that an intruder broke into her house and attacked her and her two sons. Her husband, Darren, 28, and a third son, Drake, who is seven months old, were asleep upstairs in the house. The police arrived just minutes later. As they were securing the house, they noticed that the window screen in the garage had been cut, and they failed to find any intruder, so they permitted the paramedics to enter. Darley's son, Devin, age six, was found dead, and her son Damon, age five, would die before reaching the hospital. Darley told the police that she decided to sleep downstairs so she could watch TV. She had been sleeping downstairs on and off over the last several weeks because the baby's crib was in the master bedroom, and the baby woke her up when he moved. She was asleep in the family room with Devon and Damon when she felt a nudge on her shoulder and heard Damon faintly talking. She opened her eyes and saw a stranger wearing dark clothing and a baseball cap standing over her. Now, of course, this is her report about what happened. Darley said she walked after the assailant and heard glass breaking as he fled. She got halfway through the kitchen, and then she went back to turn on a light. As she ran back toward the utility room, she saw a white-handled knife on the floor. This is when she realized that she was covered in blood. Darley reached down and picked up the knife as the intruder made his exit through a door in the garage. Darley dropped the knife and yelled upstairs to wake up Darren, her husband. This is when she dialed 911. This call to 911 lasted 5 minutes and 44 seconds. 4 minutes and 5 seconds into the call, Darley indicated that there was a knife. The operator said, there's a knife, don't touch anything. Darley responded, I already touched it and picked it up. 5 minutes and 4 seconds into the call, Darley says, the knife was lying over there, and I already picked it up. The operator says, it's all right. Darley responds by saying, I bet we could have gotten the prints, maybe, referring to prints on the knife. This statement would be used against her later on at trial. At 3.40 a.m., Darley went into surgery. So by some accounts, her wounds were severe. Specifically, the wound on her neck was only two millimeters away from her carotid artery. The surgeons also had to remove part of a necklace that had been pushed into the wound on her neck. Other cuts were on her arms as well. Other accounts, though, say that all the wounds were superficial. So we see disagreement about how severely she was wounded. Now moving to the investigation and the trial. At 6.11 a.m., detectives from the Rolette Police Department interviewed Darley. She could not offer a description of the assailant's face. Around the same time, we see that a so-called crime scene consultant named James Cron arrived at Darley's house. He stated that within 20 to 30 minutes after he arrived, he had determined that there had been no intruder, and this shaped the investigation going forward. It really ruled out the possibility of finding a suspect other than Darley or Darren. This reminds me of a short story by Edgar Allan Poe named The Murders in the Rue Morgue. There's this particular sentence from this story that I think connects over to what happened here. So I'll read this sentence. This idea, however simple it may now seem, escaped the police for the same reason that the breath of the shutters had escaped them, because, by the affair of the nails, their perceptions had been hermetically sealed against the possibility of the windows have ever been opened at all. Of course, we see there that Poe says windows have ever instead of windows having ever, but that was written a long time ago. But either way, in that story, we see that what Poe is really saying is the possibility was ruled out by the police. Again, their minds hermetically sealed. So nothing was getting in or out. And again, 
We see that here in this case. The investigation really got off to a bad start. It was extremely limited from the beginning. Now moving to June 18, we see that Darley was arrested. Evidently, the police were high-fiving and celebrating as she was arrested, so kind of disappointing to see that reaction. We see she was indicted by a grand jury on June 28th. Now, there was a change in venue in this trial because of the media coverage. The trial opened on January 6, 1997. So really, the trial started pretty quickly considering when the arrest was, especially considering this was a capital murder case. The prosecutor presented his theory that Darley was suicidal and suffered from depression. She must have killed her boys in an effort to maintain her extravagant lifestyle. Now, we hear these stories about the prosecution trying to make it seem like the motive was insurance money, but actually the prosecution did not contend that Darley killed for that money. We see in the closing arguments the prosecution talked about motive not being required. That's actually true. Motive was not required. The jury could find Darley guilty without knowing a motive or without one being demonstrated. So what I find interesting about the opening with the prosecution here is how they're kind of weaponizing mental health symptoms. So as far as the prosecution is concerned, depression just can't be something that's common and causes suffering. Rather, it must explain why people commit murder. So a real leap there that is quite illogical. It shows a real lack of understanding of how depression works. Now, in terms of specifically the thoughts of suicide, that's a little different. If somebody's at a high risk to commit suicide, they could be at a higher risk to harm other people, right? That's not usually what happens, but that could happen. We see a lot of different testimony in this trial. A physician testified that Darley's wounds could have been self-inflicted. Police officers testified that Darley seemed overly concerned with her own wounds and did not render aid to her sons, which makes me kind of wonder what level of concern would be permitted if somebody is wounded. If she had ignored her own wounds, they might have labeled her a psychopath. Also, we see that she had bruises on her arms, but those appeared later. So that kind of worked against her. Now we see about that cut window that the police determined that the dust around the window was undisturbed. Therefore, they determined that it would be impossible for anybody to have entered or exited through that window. Later, we see a demonstration that illustrated one could easily move in and out of that window without disturbing anything. We see a man's white tube sock was located near a storm drain about 75 yards from the house. The sock had blood on it from both Devon and Damon. The prosecution determined that Darley must have planted it. Now, this is interesting considering the testimony we see in this trial from the defense. We see testimony that established Damon could not have lived more than nine minutes after his wounds were inflicted. Now, taking into account the amount of time that Darley spent on the phone with the 911 operator, again, about five minutes and 44 seconds, this only leaves Darley just over three minutes to plant the sock, get back to the house, commit the crimes, stage the crime scene, and inflict those wounds on herself. The prosecution attempted to refute this by saying that she could have planted the sock beforehand and that the medical testimony around that amount of time that Damon would have lived was not precise. Now, in that 911 call, of course, Darley expresses concern about finding prints on the knife. The prosecutor says here that she did this to set up her defense. Another possible conclusion, of course, is that she wanted the person who did it to be caught. Then we have the birthday party. And this is arguably the most controversial circumstance that was brought up at the trial. The funeral for Devin and Damon was on Sunday, June 9th. Darley was released from the hospital the day before. We see on the Friday after this, June 14, that Devin would have turned seven. So Darley, other family members, and a number of friends had a birthday party at the gravesite. Now, this occurred after a private memorial service. At this party, there were balloons and toys. And during this party, we see Darley smiled, laughed, and sprayed silly string. Now, we see in the closing arguments that one of the prosecutors kind of makes a big deal about the silly string tape. He says that this tape gives you a lot of insight into this woman. During their deliberations, the jury replayed this clip of the birthday party eight or nine times. So clearly, they were considering the content of that video. Now, the lead prosecutor in this case was named Greg Davis. And when he saw this recording, this was long before the trial, he said how disgusted he was that anybody could act in that way. Now, this is an interesting choice of words for him to reveal that he was feeling disgusted. Disgust is really an emotion of eradication, disposal, and destruction. Right? So if somebody's disgusted by something, 
They want to get rid of it. It's not the same thing as fear. Now, it's interesting because Greg Davis would later be indicted on a felony unrelated to this case, tampering with a government record, although he was never convicted. Now, other testimonies spoke to perhaps a financial motive. Darley's housekeeper indicated that Darley told her that she needed $10,000. So maybe there were some money problems going on with that couple. And in fact, I think it was pretty well established that they weren't in good shape financially during that time. Now, the same housekeeper, though, also testified that she saw a mysterious black car outside of the house a few days before the murders. On one occasion, the car was in the alley behind the house, and the driver was staring into the garage. Other testimony focused more on physical evidence at the crime scene. We see there was testimony about the t-shirt that Darley was wearing. It was stitched back together, and not all the holes in the t-shirt lined up with her wounds. Specifically, there were four holes in the shirt that didn't have a corresponding wound making it look like she took the shirt off, caused the wounds, and then put the shirt back on. Now, if she was trying to get away with these crimes, it's not clear why she would have done this. It would have made more sense just to leave the shirt on. But either way, that was a theory that we saw presented. One of the other knives in that butcher block in the kitchen, specifically a bread knife, had some glass debris and rubber dust on it that matched the material in the garage window screen that was cut, making it look like Darley cut the screen with her own knife and put it back. Now, there were theories that those fibers were actually from a fingerprinting brush. That's a possibility. It wasn't really clearly established either way. Now, there was a broken wine glass on the floor. Darley's blood was found under the glass. Now, clearly the glass could have been moved by all the first responders going in and out of the house, so I don't think that was particularly powerful evidence. We see efforts were made to clean the kitchen sink and the countertop in front of the sink, and traces of blood were found on the countertop. So that doesn't look so good for Darley. Then we see testimony about blood splatter. We see an expert testify Darley could have been the murderer based on how the splatter hit the front of her shirt and the back of her shirt. The defense pointed out that her blood was mixed with her son's blood on that shirt. Now we see testimony about how the alleged assailant acted in a way that no other assailant would act. The prosecution said that he would not have cut the screen, he would not have killed in anger, he would not have left a witness. So Really, they're saying the way this criminal operated made no sense. Well, often criminals don't make a lot of sense, right? The crimes are irrational regardless of who committed them. I think this is kind of a weak prosecutorial strategy. So they're looking at this event and saying no one would do this, yet somebody did do it. They were accusing somebody of doing it. Or they're really trying to say, like, well, a criminal that breaks into houses wouldn't do this, but somehow the mother of sons would do this. So again, no matter how they want to frame it, they're saying that it was an unusual crime. So in a sense, I think they're kind of building reasonable doubt toward the defendant, as well as toward the alleged assailant that the defendant said was there. Now, looking through the transcript of the trial, the defense never brought up the idea that Darren could have committed the crime. Now, I don't think he did, but that strategy could have created reasonable doubt, right? Especially because the police kind of ruled out every suspect in the world except for Darley and Darren. Even still, I thought the defense did a good job. I thought they presented what seemed like an effective closing, pointing out that James Cron sealed Darley's fate by declaring there was no intruder soon after arriving on the scene. I thought that was a very good point. And we see, in general, the defense really hammered the low-quality investigation that occurred. Either way, though, February 1997, Darley was convicted of murdering Damon and was sentenced to death. She has not been tried in the death of Devon. So, evidently, the jury did feel that the prosecution met its burden. Now, since being convicted, Darley has filed many appeals. Some are still pending. We see that Darren divorced Darley in 2011. So now moving to the mental health and personality characteristics. So, we see here that Darley reported she had postpartum depression as well as anxiety. Evidently, she had been depressed at the time of the murders. There are some entries from a journal that seem to indicate depression, most notably on May 3, 1996. She wrote a suicide note to her children. At trial, she said it was not significant. Now, if that was the motive, right, if she wanted to end her own life, why did she plant the sock? The sock was really evidence that would have helped her defense, and she wouldn't need a defense if she was dead. We also see that Darley was trusting. She went and talked to the police without an attorney, which of course is always a bad idea. 
there's no good reason to talk to the police if you're a suspect in an investigation, we see that she did not appear really to be a criminal mastermind, right? So when looking at this evidence, like the sock being planted some distance away, I don't know if she really would have thought of that. There's nothing really clear from kind of watching the videos and reading through the transcripts that indicated she was thinking in that way, like she had that capability. Also, she had no history of violence, no history of psychopathy. I don't really see much in the way of psychopathy at all. Some have made the argument that maybe she was narcissistic, like she was materialistic and arrogant. Well, a lot of people are like that. And even if she was like that, it's not tied to murder. We also see this argument that her grieving was inappropriate, like the silly string tape. This is one of the things that aggravates me the most about how these cases are investigated. The idea that there's a right way or an appropriate way to grieve in a highly unusual situation. This is the type of circumstance that few people will ever experience, two children being murdered. Nobody knows how they would react to that. Even if one could make the argument that her way of grieving was markedly different than other people, that still doesn't point to guilt. Now moving over to the police and the prosecution. Here we see a lot of interesting factors. What really stands out to me is the lack of any type of critical thinking skills or cognitive reasoning ability. I think what happened here is they needed to believe something. They came right in there and they needed to believe that Darley was guilty. There's also the sense that they're really kind of lazy in the investigation. They did not follow up, like they didn't investigate the story about that suspicious vehicle. It's like if they were to do that, they're reducing their chances of making sure that Darley is found guilty, right? So their mission isn't to find Darley guilty. Their mission is to find the truth. And I think sometimes that gets lost when talking about these types of investigations. We also see this theory that the investigators were narcissistic. So again, just making a cursory examination and declaring that everything has been figured out and celebrating when Darley was arrested, right? It's not a happy occasion. It's not a time for high fives and a bunch of laughter and fun. Now we see that the investigators were not proficient at conducting an investigation. So in a situation like this, I'd probably say more reading would be helpful, more training, and less just kind of acting impulsively and going with one's gut. I think there was a lot of confirmation bias occurring here. They locked on to a conclusion, and then they found the evidence to support that conclusion, instead of letting the evidence guide them to the conclusion. We see a lot of flawed thinking in this investigation, so like distorted thoughts, like everything that deviates from normal is bad, or worse yet, everything that deviates from normal is criminal. We see that there was this belief that no one would grab a knife from a victim's kitchen. Well, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, did this several times, and he committed 13 murders before he was caught, right? So again, I'm left with the impression that these investigators didn't spend a lot of time reading about other cases. Now, another thing that strikes me here is perhaps these investigators were influenced by the Susan Smith case. This occurred about a year and a half before we see a young mother in Union, South Carolina, who murdered her two sons. And of course, Susan Smith would later confess. So perhaps these investigators really wanted to kind of move things ahead. They want to get ahead of the curve and just jump to the conclusion that Darley must have been guilty. So it's possible we saw a lot of illogical reasoning here. So looking at this case, what about the idea of Darley being guilty or not guilty? Which one makes more sense? Well, the standard in a criminal proceeding in Texas and the rest of the United States is the person has to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think clearly Darley is not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It's actually frightening to me that a jury could come up with any other verdict but not guilty in this case. This standard beyond a reasonable doubt can be quantified roughly as 85 to 90 percent sure. So they were about 85 to 90 percent certain that she was guilty. There's no way that they could have been that certain. That really just amazes me. Now moving over to guilt and innocence, this is a different concept, right? So guilty and not guilty are concepts under the law. Guilt or innocence is more like if we could see the perfect truth of something, the absolute truth. Was Darley guilty or innocent? Well, with all my concerns about this case, and there are many, I have many concerns about what happened here, 
I still think it's more likely than not that she's guilty. I would say the probability is somewhere between 55 to 60 percent on the side that she's guilty. Well below the reasonable doubt standard, but still more likely than not. So here I'll look at the factors pointing toward guilt and the factors pointing toward innocence. So the factors pointing toward guilt, we see Darley handled the murder weapon, right? All things being equal, this is a bad sign. If a suspect handles the murder weapon, that doesn't look good. The murder weapon was not introduced from the outside. It was from her kitchen. Certainly possible, but again, it points more toward guilt. She had recently demonstrated a desire to end her own life, so that shows a degree of despair that could be consistent with murder. The alleged assailant left behind no evidence that could identify him. The fibers from the screen on the bread knife, that looks suspicious. Why would an assailant come in from the outside and kill her sons and fail to kill her? Why did she clean the countertop and the sink? And her story changed several times, and she also claimed not to remember things that she had previously remembered. There are not many good reasons that her story should have changed if she were innocent. So now let's look at factors pointing toward innocence. Well, of course, the frightening level of incompetence demonstrated by the investigators. We never really got to see if there were any other good suspects, right? So again, that's quite disturbing. The crime, as she described it, is consistent with an assailant who is intent on assaulting her sexually. This would explain why he would have murdered the children and left her alive. So with that particular type of assailant, her story does make sense. We see really no good explanation for the sock that was found 75 yards away from her house. Also, I find it hard to believe that she would believe that anybody would find that sock. There's no evidence here that she had experience in forensic investigation. I mean, she could have left that sock there and wondered if anybody ever would have found it, right? But it became kind of a key part of her defense. So the sock kind of points toward innocence. In this case, we see no apparent motive. If her motive was to collect the $5,000 in life insurance, why didn't she target Darren? His policy was worth $800,000. If she did have some reason to kill her sons, why didn't she kill all three? Right? It's hard to think of what reason there would be just to kill two, but not to kill all three. Damon was alive when the police arrived. Right? So Darley was not a medical expert of any type. There's no reason to believe that she knew how long Damon would live. She didn't know for sure he would die before he reached the hospital. Why would she take that chance? Why would he have still been alive when the first responders arrived? Also, in this case, we see no confession. Darley has always maintained her innocence. So bringing everything together, this was a tragic case that was poorly investigated. There's so much information that we should have, but we do not have. It's a testament to how easy it is to be convicted of a crime without sufficient evidence and how difficult it is to overturn a conviction that should have never happened. This case also highlights a lot of flaws with the justice system. We see this entry point for Darley into the justice system, and pretty much for anybody, is the police. Yet the police use a different set of rules than we see in the courts. There is no reasonable doubt standard with police as they investigate crimes. So if a police officer kind of locks on, or a detective kind of locks on to a suspect, and starts, again, having that confirmation bias, that leads to that suspect getting to court, where yes, they have more rights there, but being there puts them in jeopardy, right? So that's kind of the first domino, the police. Once that domino falls, all the other dominoes can fall. When looking at the criminal justice system, we see a lot of well-educated professionals like attorneys and judges pouring over thousands of pages of documents, reading references from the law to come up with these different theories and different opinions. and it does seem to work pretty well, but all that work is based on potentially police officers making a decision within a couple seconds. Again, that's not based on any critical reasoning skills. So it seems like a lot of the thinking power is kind of expended in the courts and not enough is expended kind of out in the field in that early stage of the investigation. And my last point for this conclusion, we see that many people incorrectly assign value to how people react during times of severe stress. I've seen this in a number of cases that I reviewed, and it's really not something that's logical. People are placing a lot of meaning in something that could have absolutely no meaning, right? So, of course, potentially it has meaning, but it's not consistent. 
Her reaction could have indicated guilt. It could have indicated innocence. We have no way of distinguishing which one it really points to. I know whenever I talk about controversial cases, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.